I felt the only title appropriate for the lesson today is Around the World in 18 Days. There were two guiding scriptures that encouraged me on our travels. The first one was Colossians chapter 1. In verse 6, Paul writes, and so could we. All over the world, this gospel's bearing fruit and growing just has been doing amongst you since the day you heard it and understood God's grace in all its truth. Amen? I mean, it's exciting to think that on this trip, the word is being preached in London. The word is being preached in Moscow. The word is being preached in Chennai, India. The word is being preached in Honolulu. God is moving. Amen? Amen. Turn to John chapter 4. Verse 35, Jesus said, do you not say four months more and then the harvest? I tell you, open your eyes, look at the fields, they are ripe for harvest. This is what this scripture is telling us right here today in Los Angeles. Open your eyes, the fields are ripe unto harvest, amen? Amen. I mean, it's exciting today to be able to know that Cecilia is going to get baptized, amen, and Christine is getting baptized. Awesome to have Marcellus coming on back because we know the fields are ripe in the harvest. But you know something? Wherever you live and you turn to this passage, it reads the same thing. The fields are ripe on the harvest in London, Moscow, Chennai, and Honolulu. I want to try to share today some of the lessons that I think we all can glean from these groups that love the Lord with all their hearts. You know, first of all, for those that are visiting, a very, very, very special welcome to you. I hope you feel at home. I hope you feel part of the family. The City of Angels International Christian Church is part of a worldwide movement. It's called the Sold Out Discipling Movement. And we really are a revival movement that comes out of the International Churches of Christ the mainline churches of Christ, and the conservative Christian churches. And we are all about the dream to evangelize the nations in a generation. And so with that background, let's go to London, England. What do we learn right here? You got to repent to be radical. You know, coming into London, it it was so awesome. London's changed through the years. I remember going there for the first time in 1982, right before the mission team was about to come. We sent a very small mission team back in 1982 of only eight disciples to a city of 12 million people. They were all fired up the first Sunday because they had 17 at church, more than one for one. Amen, guys? In the first year, they saw 52 baptized. In 2001, right before the crash in our former fellowship, there were 2,200 disciples with 4,000 people every Sunday morning in London, England. Is that incredible? And then the crash came. Now today, sadly, there are six separate autonomous house churches of about 100 each, sadly, not even fellowshipping each other. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Here Paul writes, What after all is Apollos, and what is Paul? Only servants who came to believe as the Lord has assigned to each his task. I plant the seed of Paul's water, but God made it grow. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. The man who plants and the man who waters have one purpose, and each will be rewarded according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, and God's building. By the grace God's given me, I laid a foundation as an expert builder, and someone else is building on it. But each one should be careful how he builds. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one that's already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If any man builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, his work will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each man's work. If what he has built survives, he will receive his reward. If it's burned up, he'll suffer loss. He himself will be saved, but only as one escaping through the flames. Woo! This is a challenging verse. Amen, guys? You know, we we use the first part of this to talk about evangelism. That someone is met, and so, quote, the seed is planted by this person. Then someone studies the Bible, 
and the seed is watered, and then they're baptized, and God gives the increase. I think that's a fair secondary application, but the primary application of this particular passage is that Paul planted the church at Corinth. Apollos came along and preached the word there at Corinth. He watered it, and then God made it grow through people being baptized into Jesus Christ. You know, one thing that I think that we sometimes can lose sight of is that every single person that's baptized is a miracle of God. We are literally seeing them die with Christ in the waters of baptism. And when they're coming out of that water, they are resurrected to a new life. It is a miracle. It is a miracle. You know, I appreciate so much uh, Tim and Leanne Kernan. And uh, their, their little baby, Tim Jr., is He's the cutest little guy. He is huge. He's got little Popeye arms right here, you know. And they, they are an incredible couple. They're, they're, they, they love each other. They love Tim Jr. But most of all, they love the Lord and his church. And uh, when Tim went on over there and really tried to get things started with the Remnant Group in October of 2007 at the gathering, we had 19 people come forward and say, I want to be a part of this. I want to be a part of this. And so they initially became members. Then, after six months of preaching, you got to be a sold-out disciple, they were down to six members. Now, what's the Bible say right here? Paul says, I laid a foundation as an expert builder. He says, there can be no other foundation that's laid than Christ. He's not talking just faith in Christ. He's talking about having the commitment of Christ. And that every single person needs to have this commitment. And the Bible says, and Paul's talking to the whole church at Corinth right here. He says, you're all of God's fellow workers. You're all supposed to be building this way. You know, I just told Tim, I said, Tim, let's be faithful to the concept that the base of a church, the foundation of church needs to be sold out disciples. If you allow lukewarmness and sin to come into that base of disciples, it'll stop it from multiplying disciples. Tim stayed true to the vision. He stayed true to his conviction of having a base of only sold-out disciples. Now, a year later, they have 27 baptized disciples. Is that awesome? And on the Sunday that we were visiting there, we had a record 52 at church. Only two of them were children. God is moving in a great way. Right? You know, two weeks before we came, it was amazing. They had a Sunday. You can see the multiplication of the disciples start to take place. And they had three people baptized. One of them we saw in the slideshow, that was Innie. He's about 6'4", Nigerian guy. Then they had a guy named Gerg, who's from Romania. And then they had a guy named Alex baptized from Ghana. And it just, it just hit me just how international of a city London is. And of course, the great thing is a week after we left, uh, Innie's taller, younger brother, TK, was baptized into the Lord. I mean, it's, it's exciting to see God working in such a great and powerful way. You know, a year from now, Lord willing, we're going to be sending Michael and Michelle Williamson to London, England with a mission team. Now, by that time, I think the remnant group is going to be 40 or 50 disciples. Is that exciting? And then with the, a mission team of leaders, 10 perhaps here from Los Angeles, we're going to go into London and there is going to be an explosion a radical, revolutionary explosion of disciples there in London, England. The plan is to have a pillar church that evangelizes not just London, not just England, not just Great Britain, but the entire Commonwealth going into India, into Singapore, into Indonesia, into Australia, and the whole South Pacific, the whole former Commonwealth. Is is that exciting or not? In the meantime, the Kernans, when the Williamses go there, will come back to Los Angeles to complete their training. Now, they happen to be French Canadians, and as French Canadians, they're fluent in French. And so, Lord willing, a year later, we'll be sending them with the mission team to Paris, France. Amen. And that'll be our pillar church for all of Europe. In a couple of days, Tim is going to be leaving to encourage the remnant groups in Africa, in Nairobi, Kenya, and Tanzania, and to the Democratic Republic of Congo. I mean, God is moving in a powerful way out of London. And someday, when the mission team comes, there is going to be an incredible, radical, revolutionary church for Jesus Christ. Amen, church? Next, we went on to Moscow. And uh, 
If there was any challenge here, I would have to say it was to ignite them to be a light. There was no remnant group there yet when we arrived. And the moment we got there, memories just flooded back to me. See, Elaine and I had led the original Moscow mission team there in July of 1991. Now, this is before the coup. It was still the Soviet Union at this time. And I remember taking the team. We flew on into the airport. We arrived late afternoon. We tossed all of our bags into the interest hotel, this dumpy Russian hotel. It's no longer there. And then we were all so excited. We said, let's go in the Red Square. So it's just across the street. So the whole team runs under the tunnel in the Red Square. And we come out in Red Square. They're so fired up, all 17 of us. And then all of a sudden, we start looking at the enormity of Red Square. We start seeing St. Basil's in the distance. We see the wall of the Kremlin, Lenin's tomb. And then we see all these Soviet soldiers still dominating the square at that particular point. And all the enthusiasm that we entered the square with, well, now everybody's walking a lot closer together and a lot slower. And I said, okay, guys, we need to go pray. So that's when we went over to the bridge. And we all kind of huddled up in a huddle. And at first, the prayers were, you know, kind of soft. Lord, help us out. But by the end, the brothers and the sisters were praying, Lord, unleash your spirit in this nation to change this very nation in our generation. And so, the next day, I gave them an assignment. Jesus said to go out two by two. I said, here's the thing. Most of us don't speak Russian. We only had one Russian on the mission team. I said, you need to go and find a Russian that speaks both Russian and English. You need to go find yourself an Aaron, someone to speak for you. And so that's why we hung out at the McDonald's and the Pizza Hut, because that's where the Russians that spoke both English and Russian were hanging out. And so that's how we evangelized. We evangelized all day, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And then I thought to myself, oh my goodness, we're going to have a lot of people there tomorrow. And so we're kind of, uh, the mission team's going to almost be like a chorus, but we're going to have to sing some Russian songs. And so I talked to brothers, I said, brothers, we got to have maybe three or four songs that you translate that we can sing tomorrow in Russian. And like I said, we only had one Russian guy on the team, and our translators weren't the best. But I wanted to test out how we sang, so we had some of our Russian non-Christian friends come and hear us. And one of the songs I gave to the brothers for us to sing was, We Shall Overcome. But when we sang it, it wasn't translated, We Shall Overcome. It was translated, We Shall Beat You Up. Now, you got to remember the tension of that day between the Americans and the Russians. These were our adversaries. But the Russians, they were laughing at us and everything. And we had church the next morning, and we changed the translation of it. Amen. And the 17 disciples had 268 people out at church. In the first 16 days, we saw 16 people baptized into Christ. Elaine and I then took on off handed the reins of leadership over to others. And then just a couple weeks later in August, the coup came. Lynn and I are back here in L.A., and we're seeing on TV all these people coming back from the former Soviet Union, all these religious workers. They're coming off the plane crying. They're kissing the ground. So thankful because, I mean, thanks. It was very dangerous to be in Moscow in that day. And I told the brothers and sisters over there, says, we're staying. And then the phone calls started to come from the parents of the mission team people. They said, when is my kid coming back? I said, listen, they're not. The decision is this. Our mission team is there as disciples of Jesus Christ. We feel it is more important for us to stay, to show the Soviet people and to show our new Russian brothers and sisters that we love Christ more than our comfort, more than our safety, more than our very lives. To say that was an unpopular message is an understatement. Sadly, it was unpopular with some Christian leaders. A few days later, the coup ends. Religious freedom is proclaimed in the former Soviet Union. And God had gotten out of that country so many false prophets. Amen, guys? At the end of our first year, 850 people were baptized into Christ. At the end of the first year, we sent out three church plantings. The first to Novo Siberia, we had 300 at the first service. The second to St. Petersburg, I led, we had 400 at that first service. 
And then the third church planting was to Kiev, Ukraine. You see, the Soviet Union had broken up into 15 different nations. And so the third one was to Kiev, Ukraine. We had 500 at the first church service. In the first 22 days, we had 77 people baptized into Christ. God was moving in incredible ways. Amen? By the year 2001, it was amazing. We had churches of disciples in each one of the 15 nations of the former Soviet Union. There were a total of 34 churches with a total of 11,500 disciples. That's the multiplication of disciples. And then the crash came. You know, as we pulled into the hotel, we dumped our suitcases off as we did the first time. And I walked outside with Elena and Maxim and this car was sitting right in front of the hotel and I couldn't believe it. The wind of change by the scorpions was playing on the car. And if there was any song that symbolized that moment in Russia, that moment in the Soviet Union, that moment in the world when the Iron Curtain was melting, it was a song by the scorpions. It said, I followed the Moskva down to Gorky Park, listening to the wind of change. An August summer night, soldiers passing by, listening to the wind of change. The world is closing in. And did you ever think that we could be so close like brothers? The future's in the air, can feel it everywhere, listening to the wind of change. Take me to the magic of the moment on a glory night where the children of tomorrow dream away in the wind of change. Well, the winds of change are blowing again. Let's turn to the book of Nehemiah. I'm confident that everybody remembers our temple series, amen? And you remember your dates. Sort of. <laughs> My dear sister Vicki, I know you would know the dates. We remember that the first exiling of Judah was 606 B.C., as recorded in the book of Daniel, and Daniel was one of those exiles. Then, 70 years later, after the whole Babylonian exile, Cyrus becomes the king of Persia and announces that he's sending the remnant back to Zion, back to Jerusalem. The date is 536, 70 years later. It's not until 516 B.C. that the temple is built. However, Nehemiah writes 50 years after that, 466 B.C. Even though the temple's been rebuilt, the city hasn't, the walls are still destroyed. And so, 50 years after the temple's built, we get this back in chapter 1. In the month of Kis, living in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Han and I, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men. And I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that survived the exile, and also about Jerusalem. They said to me, those who survived the exile are back in the province, are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept, for some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Nehemiah was totally distraught that the walls of Zion, the walls of Jerusalem, were still broken down. You know, it's so sad. The Moscow church grew to be over 3,000 disciples, over 4,000 on Sunday mornings, and now is only a shadow of itself. Five regions that barely have 100 each morning, the walls are broken down, and God's people are in disgrace, and it's time to rebuild. But what do we have to understand about rebuilding? Well, the first thing Nehemiah did was pray, but what did he pray about? Look at this. Verse 5. Oh, Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps the covenant of love with those who love him and obey his commands, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer your servants praying before you night and day for your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself, at my father's house have committed against you. We've acted very wickedly toward you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws you gave your servant Moses. You see, Nehemiah understood the reason the walls were broken down, the reason that the temple had been destroyed in the first place, because the people of God had become unfaithful to him. And even here, Nehemiah confesses his own sin as well as the sins of his fellow Israelites. But then look what he says to God. 
Verse 8. Remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you amongst the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if you're exiled people at the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I've chosen as a dwelling for my name. I mean, who amongst us that knew about our former fellowship would deny that our former fellowship has been annihilated, it has been scattered? Amen? Well, why is it scattered? By our sins. Because, see, God loves his righteousness more than he loves his movement. But look what Nehemiah reminds God of. He says, okay, God, you scattered us in our unrighteousness, but when we return to you, you will gather us from the furthest horizon. And I can't think of an horizon too much further than Moscow, Russia. Amen, guys? And so it was exciting. We got there. Maxim and four other disciples from Kiev came. And we used to start inviting a lot of the, the Russian people. Just We only had a little bit less than two days. We reached out with Alia and with Fred. And uh, bottom line, in just two days, we were able to speak to 37 people about a remnant group starting that Sunday. Excitingly, in that crowd that night was Sasha Kostinko, the number three baptism for all the Soviet work. So I said, hey, can, can we get together with you guys? So the next night, Elena and I got with Sasha and Louisa. And so we talked, we shared. They'd been following a lot of what we'd done on the internet. And I mean, these are incredible people. Yes, he was number three baptism. She was number four baptism. They got married. They went into the ministry. By the year 2001, they were the leaders of all the 15 nations and of all the 11,500 disciples. They were those leaders. And you talk about people that are heartbroken about what's happened. It's them. And I said, okay, here's the thing. We have come to rebuild. We have come as a new movement of God. Would you join us? And they said, absolutely. They're with us now. Sasha's running things over there. And here's the good news. Here's the good news. They're going to be moving to Los Angeles at the end of July and joining the City of Angels Church to get strengthened in the Lord and then to go back and preach the word in Moscow, Russia. God is moving. Yes, God scattered us, but God is gathering us. New remnant groups formed in Moscow. Recently, a new remnant group formed in Mexico City and a new remnant group formed in Manila. God is moving all over the world. And the church said... On to Chennai, India, the price to proclaim. That's what we learned there. Flying in to India, you almost always fly in at midnight. And it's, it's a little bit cooler then, about 90, 95 degrees at night then. And the thing that's funny about India, there seems to always be kind of a haze in the air. But the thing that was so heartwarming, Lynn and I were pretty, pretty tired at this point in our journey, but 20 disciples from the Chennai Sister Church we're there to meet us. And you know, there's just something when you see disciples and they give you hugs and they're fired up. I mean, it just, it just got us going. I mean, it was, it was so encouraging there. You know, I, I thought about back in 1986 when we sent the first mission team over there from Boston to Bombay, India. And uh, I mean, it was, it, was, it was an incredible mission team. Twelve disciples, none of them Indian. And they had to go and learn Hindi because India is basically a Hindu nation. It's over one billion people. The United States is only 300 million. One billion people. And uh, they went over there and it was, it was a tough language internship. They had one baptism and she fell away. And I remember coming on over there to start the church, the inaugural service, right in January of 87. And it was awesome because they needed their faith recharged but it was amazing. God had sent this young Indian lady in with just the most open heart, and the sisters were studying with her. And by the Sunday of our conference, she was ready to be baptized. And, but they were unprepared for it. And so I said, well, where can, we, where can we go to have the baptism? I said, well, there's a swimming pool over here at this apartment area not too far away. So the whole conference walks on over this apartment area. And uh, I remember... The, the leader, Jim, saying, okay, guys, we've got to sing quietly. But, you know, all the disciples are fired up. Finally, a baptism, you know. And, and by chance, the swimming pool was located in, in the middle of these super tall apartment buildings. And even as we, quote, sang quietly, it was like an echo going off each of the apartment buildings. 
And you start seeing heads poke out like this, you know. Then Jim took the young lady in the water, took her down. What is your good confession? And she said, Jesus is Lord. It seemed to reverberate off the apartments. And then Jim baptized, comes up, the mission team starts clapping, and then everybody in the window starts clapping. I mean, it was incredible. People were fired up. That first year, 59 people were baptized in the Christ. The second year, 200 people were baptized in the Christ. By 2001, that little group of 12 had expanded beyond the borders of India into Nepal, into Sri Lanka, into Bangladesh, into Pakistan, and Afghanistan. There were now a total of 32 churches and 5,000 disciples. And then the crash came. You know, in going to be with Raja and Debs, that's, that's what she's supposed to be called, not Debbie, but Debs. Um, it was just so great to be with them. They lived so humbly. And, and yet their hearts are just so sold out to God. We got there. We had church. We probably had about 70, 80 people at church. But I said, Raja, the Lord retaught me a lesson there in London. We've got to rebuild a base of sold-out disciples. And so right now, they're going through, counting the cost with people individually to build the base so they can launch the Chennai International Christian Church. Amen, guys? Amen. But if anything inspired me, it was the fact that this was the place that tradition holds that the Apostle Thomas died. Now, he holds special interest to me because even though my nickname is Kip, my real name is Thomas. And after being there, seeing the situation, studying some scriptures, we've got to fix up Thomas's reputation right here. Okay, guys? Let's go to John chapter 20. I mean, he's my namesake, so we, we got we to work on this a little bit. In John chapter 20, Jesus has resurrected from the dead. And we read in verse 24, Now Thomas, called Didymus, Didymus means the twin, he was a twin, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord! But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. We see the first time that Jesus appeared after the resurrection, Thomas wasn't there. That'll teach him to miss church. Amen, guys? Verse 26. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood amongst them and said, Peace be with you. They said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hand. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you've seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Of course, this is the passage that we get the term doubting Thomas. But you know, if you look at all scripture, you'll find that it's only Thomas that addresses Jesus as God. He's the only apostle that says, my Lord and my God. So we know that this guy was a man of deep spiritual insight. Amen? Let's go to John chapter 11. Right here, earlier in the ministry of Jesus, this is the time when Lazarus dies. And we read in verse 11 of chapter 11. After Jesus said this, he went on to tell the apostles, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going there to wake him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he'll get better. Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought it meant natural sleep. So then he told him plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I'm glad that I was not there, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Then Thomas, called Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. Thomas alone of the disciples understood that to follow Jesus meant that you would die with him. You know, it's very interesting in visiting southern India. It's a tradition there that Thomas came there in 52 AD and was martyred in 72 AD. And I started thinking to myself, could that possibly be? I mean, this is a, quote, tradition. But then I started thinking, you know something? 
every Bible scholar in the world dates Acts 15, the Council of Jerusalem, at 49 or 50 A.D. And at that particular time, Paul comes to Jerusalem, and awaiting him is James, that's the half-brother of Jesus, and it says the apostles and the elders. And then if you'll look at the entire rest of the book of Acts, as a matter of fact, even when Paul gets there after his third missionary journey, you'll find that who greets him is just simply James and the elders. After Acts 15, there is no collective mentioning of the apostles. What do I think happened? I think they were convinced by the persuasion of Paul and Barnabas that indeed the Gentiles had been set apart for salvation. And even though Jesus had commanded them to stay in Jerusalem, now it was time to go into all the world. And the timing is perfect. If he leaves there about 50, 51 AD and goes down the Silk Road down to the southern part of India, he would be there at 52 AD. Is that incredible? Now, here's the great testimony. Back in the late 40s and early 50s, the nations of Pakistan and Bangladesh broke off from India and became Muslim nations. And so it left India basically Hindu. But the amazing thing is, in the southern part of India, it's 25% quote, Christian. His legacy lives to this day. And you know something? The Hindu people are challenging to convert. But these people that have accepted a false form of Christianity, they're a lot easier to convert. You see, even to this hour, we are reaping the fruit of Thomas's ministry. This is a man who doubted, but then he believed. You don't die for a lie. He died because he believed that Jesus Christ was raised dead. How about you? Do you really, really, really believe? If you really believe, then you're going to have the heart of a first century Christian. Do anything, go anywhere, give up everything. You understand that it's all about saving souls for Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. My question to you is, who do you have with you at church today? We talk about dying for the cause. How about about dying to ourselves? Just on everyday basis of complacency and comfort. Brothers and sisters, we need to join our brothers and sisters abroad, and it's time to work for the Lord. It's time to be like our forefather Thomas and be prepared to die for the cause of Christ. You know, we left Chennai late as we flew out of there, and uh, we're supposed to go on to Australia, but the Spirit blocked us. Turn to Acts chapter 16. In Acts 16... Paul wanted to go someplace too. It says in verse 6, Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia in Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. Wow, it was God that stopped him. We ask, well, why did he stop him? Well, we understand that God gave Paul the Macedonian vision to go on to Europe, and that was when Paul got this vision to evangelize the world. Well, the question is, it comes then, well, what happened to Asia? Did God forget about Asia? Now, Asia, we understand, is not the, the continent of Asia as we talk about today. Asia is the western part of modern-day Turkey, or Asia Minor. Turn to Acts chapter, 16, uh, Acts chapter 19. Paul goes to Ephesus. That's the main city in Asia, western part of Turkey. He baptizes 12 guys there. Verse 7. And then we read in verse 8, Paul and the synagogue spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some of them became obstinate. They refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. So Paul left them. He took the disciples with him and had daily discussions in the lecture of Tyrannus. This went on for two years so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. That's incredible. Paul starts out with 12 guys. Now that's a good number to start with, amen, guys? And he has... Daily Bible talks there on the campus, amen, a little campus ministry, the lecture of Tyrannus. This goes on for two years, and the Bible says, all the prophets of Asia heard the word of the Lord. Well, what does that mean? Turn to the book of Revelation. Revelation 1. In verse 4. What is the book of Revelation addressed to primarily? John. 
to the seven churches in the province of Asia. Oh, my gosh. This means in that two-year period that not only is Ephesus planted, but these other six churches are planted. Look at chapter 2. You just go right through it. Church at Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. All in two years' time, everybody in the province of Asia heard. And you know something? Being there in Singapore, it's too bad we don't have a remnant group in Singapore. But someday, I really believe we are going to have a super fruitful group in Singapore. And it might indeed be the launching pad to go into China. Amen, church? The last place that we got to preach the word was in Honolulu, Hawaii. And I simply put right here the example for every city. You see, in the ICOC, the old Honolulu church was planted in 1989, just with a handful of disciples. And it was an amazing church. It grew to 1,000 disciples by 2001, 1,500 on Sundays. Planted the church in uh, Maui, the church in Hilo, and the church in Guam. That's where the Antalans were baptized. Amen, guys? So we owe a great debt of gratitude right there. But today, that church has less than 200 on Sundays. It's totally annihilated. Hawaii is a very important part of our history, of our young movement, because it was in Hilo, Hawaii, that really served as the inspiration to start a new movement in 2006. You see, the Hilo church at one time was 100 people, had 60 disciples. They were on fire for God. And then the crash came with all the mainline theology. And in a few years, they asked a young man named Kyle Bartholomew to take over as the preacher. He's totally inexperienced. This was in the summer, 2006. And they said, Kyle, we, we want to send you to a seminar, to something where you can learn more. He says, I want to go to the Portland Jubilee. That was in August. And so he came to Portland. He says, man, this is the church I want to build. This is incredible. And so he came to Elena, myself, he says, hey, we, we, we would really like for you to disciple us and, and help us build the church there in Hilo. I said, well, bro, I'd, I'd love to come and help you, and Elena would love to come and help Joan, but bottom line, you know, you're going to have to get your leadership behind that because you may not know this, but I'm slightly controversial. <laughs> and he says, well, bro, don't worry about it. But he went all back. The leadership got behind it. We were there a month later. When we came... There were evangelists from, sadly, the ICOC that are opposed it. Now, you got to understand, the Hilo Church had gone down to about 35 or 40 on Sundays. And I asked Kyle, how many you got on Wednesday night? He said 12, 15. I said, that's your real church. By the end of the weekend, there were two churches. There were the 12 that were with Kyle and Joan. And there was a small group that went with our former fellowship. That small group in our former fellowship has yet to baptize anybody now, three years later. In the very first year, those 12 with Kyle and Joan saw 20 people baptized into Christ. I mean, the difference is obvious. Turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. In 1 Corinthians 4, Paul writes, the church of Corinth. And you remember we studied earlier that he planted this church. And so he writes in verse 14, I'm not writing this to shame you, but to warn you as my dear children. Even though you have 10,000 guardians in Christ, you don't have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I became your father through the gospel. Therefore, I urge you to imitate it. For this reason, I'm sending you Timothy, my son, whom I love, who is faithful Lord. He'll remind you of my way of life in Christ Jesus, which agrees with what I teach everywhere in every church. You know, sadly, what happened to the Honolulu church, what happened to our former fellowship is just very sad. They abandoned the call of discipleship that every person needs to be a sold-out disciple before they're baptized. They abandoned discipling. Some places calling it optional, other places calling it wrong. They abandoned the idea of a movement, and they moved into autonomy. They abandoned a central leader and a central leadership. And bottom line, they abandoned the dream to evangelize the world in a generation, calling it impossible, in some cases, a false teaching. You know, right here in this passage, in 1 Corinthians, it seems clear to me 
that even though Paul was not in Corinth, he still had authority in Corinth because he was the father in the faith. He had so much authority, he was even saying, who went in there to preach the word? And this is, this is bold on Paul's part. He says, you know, Corinthian church, you guys got a lot of problems. And if you've ever read the book of 1 Corinthians, you know they have a lot of problems. He says, but here's how you'll fix every problem. Just imitate me. Now that's bold. That's bold. But Paul, in 1 Corinthians 11, says, I imitate Christ. Amen? But Paul says, the way you fix your problems is imitate me, and here's how we're going to do it. I'm going to send my young apprentice, Timothy. You imitate him. Therefore, you'll imitate me, and therefore, you'll imitate the Lord. He says, this is what I teach everywhere in every church. See, this is why in the first century, no matter which church you went to, you were welcomed because they had the same life and the same doctrine. And that is the foundation of Jesus Christ. Are you with me here, church? You see, we need to have a conviction about having overseeing evangelists. So when Elena and I went to Honolulu, I had this kind of this pit in my stomach. We were there for a reason. And though I will not detail all the different challenges that we found there, absolutely, God had sent us to Honolulu to fix things up. And as a father in the gospel to the remnant group, I've known Joseph and Mary, they were there in Hilo back in 2006. They were receptive, and of course, a trained uh, Kyle and Joan, and they were receptive. And we were able to get the church focused and back on the mission. Why? Because there's an overseeing evangelist with authority that comes on in and calls people to the foundation of Jesus Christ. You know, it's exciting. Already in the first 10 months of the work, they've seen 20 people baptized, eight people restored, there are over 40 disciples, and they're having 80 to 90 on Sunday. God is working in a powerful way in Honolulu, Hawaii. You know, in coming home, I, I was looking forward to coming home. And I, I felt badly that we had to miss the 10th because, in effect, that was our second anniversary here at the City of Angels International Christian Church. And amazing, in our first two years, we saw 200 people baptized, 80 people restored, and sent out three church plantings. Now, that's only been done one other time in modern church history in Moscow. Amen, guys? I mean, the Lord has done great things through you. And yet, you know, the challenge still remains to make sure that we are a base, a foundation of sold-out disciples. Let's go back to the book of Revelation to close on out. Remember, Paul was there at Ephesus. And in the 90s, Jesus gives this revelation to John and this message to the church at Ephesus. Verse 1, chapter 2. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks on the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, your perseverance. I know you cannot tolerate wicked men and have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. You persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. Now you've got to admit, that is a cranking compliment for the church there. Amen, guys? But look what he says. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. Remember the height from which you've fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you did not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. You know, the Bible teaches that when you lose your first love, you're in danger of losing your salvation. If you die without your first love, you will not be saved. If Jesus comes again and you don't have your first love, you will not be saved. It's a very serious condition. You may still be going to church, but if you don't have a first love, you're not right with God. You know, we understand that. I mean, it's been, it's been great to have the new marriages in the church, right? I mean, David and Margarita, you know, they, they're so happy together. And Dave's put on a couple pounds like a lot of the, you know, the guys do, you know. But that's just some good cooking right there. And all of us guys have been married a while. We understand that. And, you know, when people are first married, you know, they, you see that glow, that aura. But sadly, and some of us understand this from our own homes. People can be under the same roof, quote, married, but not have a first love. And many of us come from divorced homes. And we know the scarring that that does. We understand that when there's not a first love between a man and a woman, 
Something's wrong in that house. How much more so in the house of the Lord? When people don't have a passionate first love for Jesus, something's wrong. You know, I remember my own life. Back when the crash for our former fellowship came, I lost my first love. See, I had tied God and the movement together. And so when the movement crashed, my faith in God crashed. I had tied my identity of being a son of God, a disciple, to being a leader. And when I was no longer leading, then my motivation crashed. I had, I had to separate out God from the movement. God is, is more awesome than I ever thought. And the movement, well, eh, it's like Carlos and me and Michael. Amen. Sinners, flawed. I remember when I was baptized. I was baptized at 17 years old as a freshman in college. And when I was baptized, I, I so felt I'd found the truth. I was so fired up for God. And here I was in 2001, 2002, just depressed, down unmotivated, hard to go to church because my identity being a leader, and if I wasn't leading, then, then I wasn't anything. And I said, you know, I got to repent. I, I'm still saved. I'm still a son of God. I'm still a disciple. I got to get fired up and be as fired up as the day that I got baptized. I had to come face to face with my sins. So my sins, I'd let people idolize me and I liked it. I had to deal with the fact that I had been merciless with weak people. Wow. I mean, I, whoa. When, when you get in touch with these things, I mean, sometimes, see, you know, you know you're not doing good spiritually if you're man-focused. If you're looking at other people, looking at your leader. You're only doing good spiritually if you look things from God's perspective. And I had to take a step back and say, hey, okay, Kip, where's your sin? And when I started to see my sin, and realized I needed forgiveness, then I could forgive those that sinned against me. You know, last month in April, April 11th, was my 37th spiritual birthday. And in about two weeks, May 31st, is going to be my 55th real birthday. And that's, that's, that's an important date for some of you young people because you see at 55, you get the Denny Senior Discount. Now, let's have no jealousy out there. No jealousy. You have to live a long time in order to earn that kind of respect. But you know something? You get to be 55. You figure something out. You're going to die. And, 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 and yeah, I know intellectually all of you, oh, yeah, I know I'm going to die. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. You know, I'm going to die. And it's a very purifying thing. You start asking yourself, what am I going to do with the uh, days, months, years that the grace of God gives me to live? What am I going to do? How am I going to spend this time? You know, the challenges of today, I think, are clear. From London, you got to repent to be radical, R. From Moscow, we got to ignite to be a light, I. From Chennai, there's a price to proclaim, P. And from Honolulu, an example for every church, E. Ripe. The fields are ripe unto harvest. I'll be 55, but in my heart, I'm 17. <laughs> not, not exactly in my body, it's in my heart. Because, see, that's the only way you can be. Whenever you got baptized, that's how you need to be. You need to understand. You need to have a clear understanding that the winds of change are blowing. Oh, they're blowing in London. They're blowing down to Africa. They're blowing through Europe and into Russia. They're blowing down through Asia into India, 
in Singapore and Australia. They're blowing in the Hawaiian Islands where that little church is such a great example. For that remnant group of two multiplied to 14 with Joe and Mary. We sent the mission team of Kyle and Joan over. There was no money given by the LA church. See, the remnant group gave the money when we sent the trained evangelist and the mission team. It's an example for every church. It could be done everywhere. And so the challenge before me and the challenge before you is to simply believe and not doubt that the fields are ripe under harvest. Thank you, and God bless.